we have so many students that they are so brilliant, but then their identity and their being and their mathematical brilliance doesn't find its way not only out for themselves, but in ways that it can also inspire and contribute to the learning of others. Today, we speak with Farshid Safi from the University of Central Florida. We reached out to Farshid after his presentation at NCTM's 100 Days of Learning caught our attention. In Farshid's work with educators, he helps teachers to see how context and connection takes priority above all else. We love that. He weaves the mathematical content we have to teach with student identity and their humanness. Stick around while we learn how to have conversations about equity with your colleagues, why we need to be generalists instead of specialists, and how we as educators impact our community. Hey, let's cue it up. Welcome to the Making Math Moments That Matter podcast. I'm Kyle Pierce from TapIntoTeenMinds.com. And I'm John Orr from MrOrr-IsGeek.com. We are two math teachers who, together, with you, the community of math moment makers worldwide who want to build and deliver math lessons that spark curiosity, fuel sense-making, and ignite your teacher moves. John, are you ready to dive into this awesome episode that's going to bring the humanness of mathematics Mm -hmm. and content Mm -hmm. knowledge together. What do you say? Of course, Kyle. Of course, we are honored to bring Farshid on. And uh, before we get into that conversation, we'd like to take a moment and talk about the 2020 Make Math Moments Virtual Summit, which is coming up on Saturday, November 7th and Sunday, November 8th, which right now it is open for registration. Right. You're absolutely right, John. This is one of the favorite times of year for you and I because we get the Mm -hmm. honor of bringing some amazing math minds from the math education space straight to you in the comfort of your own home. And you know what? We continue to find ways that we can do it free. Yes, that means free for you to attend live and to catch some replays. I know it's you've probably felt like you've been doing a lot of PD from home, but if you want some more amazing math professional learning from the comfort of your couch, we encourage you to pause this episode right now and head to makemathmoments.com forward slash summit to register for the 2020 Make Math Moments Virtual Summit. That's right. We're running our second annual free online math professional development summit for K through 12 educators. That's right. There's something for everyone at Mm -hmm. this event. The dates again are Saturday, November 7th and Sunday, November 8th. And actually, John, Farshid from this episode Mm -hmm. is going to be one of our over 30 presenters. Coolest part yet, some of the sessions will be happening live over Zoom while others are pre-recorded for you to enjoy at uh, your convenience over the weekend and up to a week afterwards through replays. How exciting. This year, some of our speakers include past guests from this podcast, like Marion Small, who we not only talk to on the podcast, but also we reference quite a bit. Mm -hmm. Her session is called Think the Math, and then actually the next part of the title is Do the Math with a Line Through It. So I'm really excited to get her perspective on how it's not just about doing the math, it's about thinking and reasoning through the math. Yeah, and another recent guest we've had on the podcast is Dan Meyer, and he is sharing a session called Connected and Creative Math Classrooms in a Time of Crisis. I know that a lot of us are looking for resources in this weird time, so we'll be checking out Dan's session. Yeah, I'm excited to hear what his thoughts are on helping us as educators get over that remote learning hump. And how about Candace Wilson McCain, who hasn't been on the podcast yet, but I promise you we're going to be bringing her on in the near future, who's speaking about problem-based learning. You folks at home know how much we love problem-based learning. Her session is called Nine Steps to PBL Success, Mm. the impactful PBL roadmap. I don't know who is actually more excited, Kyle, the Math Moment Maker community or us. Go ahead, everyone, right now, register for this year's summit at makemathmoments.com forward slash summit. 
If you're listening to this episode after this year's summit, well, the replays will be up until Friday, November 13th. And then they're going to be put away in the Make Math Moments Academy for all of our members to gobble up at will at any time. Hop into the summit at makemathmoments.com forward slash summit to catch those replays or to find how you can get into the academy to watch them. All right, enough from us, my friends. Let's get on to this fantastic conversation with Farshid. Hey there, Farshid. Welcome to the Making Math Moments That Matter podcast. Kyle and I are so excited to have you on the show today. How are you doing down in Florida? Uh, I'm doing well. Thank you for asking and thank you for having me. Awesome stuff. Awesome stuff. We are really excited to have you. I've been following you for quite some time on Twitter. I know that we've had a few interactions along the way, but I never had an opportunity to really go and see you present until recently during NCTM's 100 Days of Math. So I'm really excited to talk about a few things that intrigued me about your presentation. We'll get into that later. But before we do, tell us a little bit about yourself. What is your role in math education? Maybe tell us a little bit about your journey of what landed you here. Sure. So I'm a university teacher educator. So I teach at the University of Central Florida. So I'm a mathematics educator, but I also work with our undergraduate students and our graduate students, our PhD students, but I'm also very involved with our public schools, K through 12. And so I make every effort to continue to learn and grow in K through 12 and even delving into college mathematics because I just believe in supporting our students and our schools, our universities and our communities that way. I don't separate who I am as a person from what I do professionally. I intentionally blur those lines, and I don't necessarily have a way of keeping sort of a barrier in between those two. That's definitely something I think I feel like educators do. You know, it's like educators are just educators and as human beings. It's hard for us all to, I think, kind of separate the lines between those two things. Whereas I guess I can't really speak for other professions because I've only been an educator, but I sometimes wonder about whether, you know, like when I go home from work from another job, work is work and home is home and we don't blur those lines. But educators, it's, it's really hard to do that. And I actually, like you, I wouldn't want to separate those two things. To me, those boundaries are somewhat artificial and forced. And so the more that we can intentionally make sure that we humanize all of our experiences, whether they're in a formal education setting or whether they're at home or whether it's just hanging out with friends and colleagues. I'm wondering a a little bit about the background on how you got into teaching. I think a lot of listeners of the show are interested in hearing as educators, they know how they got into teaching, but oftentimes interested in how other people have got into the education world. So would you be able to kind of give us a backstory there? So I think who we are as teachers is completely interwoven with who we are as people. And so I want to say that my teaching journey is very much connected to my personal journey. And so if you would sort of oblige me to kind of give you a brief synopsis of my timeline, I was born in Jacksonville, Florida, 1971. And my father was finishing his medical school residency and everything. Uh, We were from Iran originally. And so when I was a month old, he was finished. So we moved back to Iran. And so I grew up in Iran. My entire family was living there at the time. And so from 1971 to 1985, I grew up surrounded by lots of love and family and went through school, elementary, and also middle school. And it wasn't until the mid-80s where, because of the Iran-Iraq war, we had to immigrate because they were drafting younger and younger kids, literally kids, 17, 16, 15-year-olds. And my parents made the ultimate sacrifice of leaving everything, family, fortune, professional aspirations, and everything they'd worked for to provide safety for us as their children. That's when we came here back to sort of Florida. But during the first few years here, during my high school years, I went through three different schools in two different states. And so you got to explore a lot of things as an English language learner as a person of color, and as an immigrant, trying to just find your way, and yet always being fueled by love and support 
and the stress from a family standpoint and a cultural standpoint of the importance of being able to just elevate people through caring, but also through your actions personally and also professionally. And so that part of my upbringing still is a huge part of who I am. And it's what I try to bring with me to every group that I'm privileged to work with in that way. Oh, that's fantastic. I'm really happy that you've given us a very clear picture of who you are as a human. Oftentimes, I think back to some of our episodes with Hima Kadai and even recently Dan Meyer, who just was released uh, recently this week. And oftentimes we as teachers, especially high school teachers, John and I coming from the high school class, we tended to kind of put the math first and the human second. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like you've kind of got that advantage, that flip where you've come at it from a different approach and that has to pay dividends in the classroom. And we'll dive deeper into that specific to your presentation. I see a really nice tie in, but I don't want to let this one off of the radar because we ask every guest who comes onto the podcast to describe a memorable math moment from your past. You've shared a little bit about your own past growing up and being born in Jacksonville, Florida, and then spending time in your home country, your family's home country, and then having to essentially leave everything behind. I'm wondering, what about math? Like, Where did math fit in? And maybe it is or maybe it isn't related or connected back to like a memorable math moment from your past. But I'm curious, what might that look like or sound like for you? I think favorite math or memorable math moments are made on a day-to-day -day basis. And so if you were to ask me, it's almost like snapshots in your life. The snapshot of a memorable moment that I may have had early on in my career would have been the pure joy of being able to help people through understanding mathematics a little more comprehensively and through being able to connect in the sense making and being able to just empower people through learning and teaching in that way. The more I've gone on, my journey, both physically, professionally, and mathematically, has taken me from Florida to moving up to beautiful British Columbia when I lived and met my wife uh, up there. And experiencing the differences in how education, university education, and how people are just beautiful wherever you go. But how much of that do we bring in intentionally into the ways that we engage our students and our fellow colleagues in the teaching and learning of mathematics? And so the places, the people, and the opportunities, be it in Florida, be it in Vancouver, be it in New Jersey, where I taught for several years, and all the journeys by working with teachers and school districts around the country in Canada, around the US and Canada, have helped me to have so many memorable math moments. But the common denominator for all of them is being able to support, being able to engage, being able to empower and elevate people before we elevate them mathematically, elevating them as people. That's a great message for all of our listeners. And I think like what Kyle said is that we came from a place where we always talked math first and people not even, I spent time just thinking about my math lessons. You know, I'm ashamed to say that I didn't see my high school students as like, I guess I saw them as people, but I didn't see my class as a place where I, my job is to recognize differences in people and elevate that or recognize that. I always try to plan lessons just to get the math out and then just help kids understand it. I actually just treated people, everyone the same. It was like, hey, I plan lessons like kids were the same. And I did that for a number of years. And it's only these last few years where I've tried to change and recognize that, you know what, we are human teachers first and say math is in there too, but we can use math to help kind of bring out the human aspects of ourselves. So I really like that comment that you made that math moments are made daily or can be made daily. So that's an awesome thing for us to think about too, us being a uh, priding ourselves on kind of making math moments and how we can do that for our students. And on that note, John, when I listen to you, it also makes me realize that our growth and our journeys are in no way sort of monotonically increasing, you know, right? in the sense that 
the ways that we grow sometimes require us to reflect and to revise our mm-hmm. actions that may have been fruitful, may have been beneficial for some, but they could be so much more. And so the educator and the person that I am today, hopefully, is a better version of me than even five months mm-hmm. ago. Exactly. And there's that right. commitment piece that I know all of us are invested in wanting to sort of be the best versions of ourselves professionally and personally. Yes, no, absolutely. And that's so important. And I think, too, going all the way back to the beginning of your math moment where you had said that these moments are made every day. And I agree, they are, they can be made and should be made every day. But I wonder how often they either go unnoticed in math class or maybe we've completely avoided some of these moments from happening through maybe how we teach. I know for a number of years, the moments my students remembered may not be the moments I wish they did remember about my class. And I think the message I'm hearing from you right now is this idea of we're all constantly growing and we always have to continually look to ourselves and how we can grow as educators and as people, again, coming back to that human element. So I think it leads us into a The next piece I really wanted to talk to you about, because this is something I found really interesting about your presentation through the 100 Days of Math on NCTM. We'll include the link to that presentation in the show notes. But I feel like since I've been in the conference scene, and what I mean by that is I went to my first conference long after I became an educator, and that's really what shifted me to start changing the way I thought about teaching and about mathematics. And over time, I started to at least notice it. Maybe it was always there, but I noticed that more and more sessions or the ones I was noticing had this importance of promoting equitable teaching practices as well as focusing on making connections and content knowledge. So one thing I did see, though, is that it seemed like there was like these sessions over here that focus on this, on equitable teaching practices, access and equity and diversity and looking at students as individuals. And then there was this like other group of presentations that focused on content knowledge or making connections. But your presentation, you chose to bring both of these together very intentionally. And I feel like you've sort of already answered a part of this, but what inspired you to actually act on highlighting the importance of both? Because so far you've talked about the importance of us as humans and about how we can serve our communities And in this case, with mathematics and education, what inspired you to highlight the importance of focusing on both instead of hyper-focusing on one over the other? If I can sort of use the example of we don't know what we don't know until we begin to experience it. And so I make a deliberate point of when the opportunities permit to travel and then to take and go places and explore with my wife and kids and see the world so we can learn from the beautiful ways and the brilliance of other people. And we were doing that, and I've been doing that, and I've been privileged to do that on a personal level. But then we have so many students that they are so brilliant, but then their identity and their being and their mathematical brilliance doesn't find its way not only out for themselves, but in ways that it can also inspire and contribute to the learning of others. So as a teacher and as a teacher educator, I feel like I have to increase my intentionality and my commitment to just continue to educate myself and play a role in how it is that we listen to the experts, not just mathematically and pedagogically, but how do we just rehumanize mathematics education with and for our students, because it's not ours to give, but it is ours to influence and it is ours to contribute to. One part of your presentation we really appreciate is, you know, you involve your background as both Iranian and American. Do you mind unpacking this section of the presentation for our listeners so that we can better understand why you think it's important to remove that hyphen? Sure. I think in our mathematical training, many of us learn to appreciate structure. And I do too. We want to know, does this belong in this class or in this class? Does it belong in set A or in set B or the intersection of sets A and B? Is it one? Is it both? Is it the intersection? Is it neither? So mathematics in some ways allows for this structuring. But what we don't focus on is 
Now, given the power of such structure, when does it marginalize? How does it marginalize? So for instance, when you have someone like me, and my story is in no way unique, but it is the one that I know how to tell because I've lived it Mm -hmm. and I continue to live it. What happens when you are Iranian, but you're not Iranian enough because you only spent, say, the first 13 years of your life there, and you've spent the vast majority of your life benefiting and living in a different culture and country? You are Iranian fully, culturally, in your heart, in your mind, in your being, in your family, but to many Iranians, you're not Iranian enough. At right. the same time, mm-hmm. you are American by birth, you are American by culture, you appreciate all of those things, and yet in society, in community, in politics, you are certainly othered in many ways. So the role of identity, the role of representation, and this othering that happens, it happens racially, it happens religiously, it happens through language. So Something that I can mention to you is I'm trying to learn more about how we shift away from this binary designation in general, whether it relates to race, whether it's to sexual orientation, to language, to immigration status, to any of these things. Because I fully consider myself a person who immigrated here. But when I read the fine print, they're like, well, no, you were born here. So how could you be an immigrant? Or, for instance, they'll say, you learned English at age 13, all right, but we listen to you now, and so I don't know which one is your first language. And I would maintain it's not for others to decide. So I think the complexity of identity is very, very important. Absolutely. And that was something that really struck me during that presentation. And I wanted to make sure we asked about it because you bring up some really interesting pieces where you're kind of feeling like you're in this middle ground in a less, I would say, less important, but, you know, try to make a metaphor for some who may have participated in something. I'm picturing myself as, let's say, a guitar player. Like a lot of people will say, oh, Kyle, you have a guitar. Do you play guitar? Mm -hmm. I always tend to say, like, I fiddle. Like, I'm not really a guitar player. Like, I like to play on the, you know. But at the end of the day, it's like, no, I I am a guitar player. They didn't ask me how good of a guitar player I was. Mm -hmm. And I feel like we can kind of connect that idea here where you're thinking, like, we have to look at people as who they are and that everyone brings a unique experience, regardless of whether you were born in one country and have stayed there your entire life. Whether your skin is one color, obviously, or what tone or what, you know, there's so many different pieces here that we have to really be aware of so that we can better understand and meet our students as individuals. So we've been talking here on this podcast about access and equity a lot, quite a bit lately, especially with things that have happened in the spring and continuing to happen. They might not be in the news right now. Things go in the background. But there's a lot of things we need to be working on in terms of access and equity. We're wondering, though, for those who are listening and feeling like they don't know how to get started on this journey, or maybe they're on this journey, but they feel like they're stuck. What are some tips or advice or ideas that you might have to help them not only bring that anxiety level down where they maybe feel like they're not doing enough or they don't know enough or they don't know where to get started or to get nudged along that journey. Do you have any ideas that might help them get going or get out of that rut that they're feeling right now? The first thing I would say is I'm on that journey with you and that it is like everything else. I think that If we look at it as an on-off switch or the light came on to being woke or being socially conscious, I don't know that that's actually the accurate way. To me, coming into more of a realization and acknowledgement and awareness and then moving towards action at best is a dimmer switch. It is in no way an on-off switch. And so I think learning is the same way. Growing is the same way. Appreciating people and cultures and experiences is the same way. So things happen gradually. And sometimes that gradual growth does require a few intentional pauses and maybe some steps back to retrace what we knew 
or some of the implicit biases that might exist. And I'm still learning about them. So I think part of it comes through being fair to ourselves, but at the same time, having the personal and the professional humility to want to stay committed to this, and then having a community that supports us in wanting to do better. And then as we know better, we do better individually and collectively. I often wonder when we're on these journeys together, and I'm really glad that you said we're always growing together. But I'm thinking about when I'm working with colleagues at my school, and especially I find this in high school, where you might be discussing these ideas that we're talking about here with your colleagues. And then you run into a teacher who says, well, I teach math and we do math in my math class. We don't teach this other stuff. We'll let English deal with that or we'll let history deal with that. Like, I'm just doing content. I'm just doing uh, math. Like these teachers that you work with and lots of our listeners have teachers that they work with who say these things. And, And I guess I'm wondering to help them out, our listeners out with these kinds of conversations. Do you have any tips or advice to kind of like broach that subject or just have those conversations? I think one of the ones that I've found to be very, very empowering is making sure that the context stays up front and center throughout. And this is one of the reasons why I've become more invested in learning about mathematical modeling, even as a way to get at teacher content knowledge. Because with modeling, you have to stay with the context and the conditions throughout. So you don't decouple the context from the mathematical processes or the procedures that you might sort of take. So if the content and connections, if the mathematical ones are always coupled with and married to the context, the communities, the people, and the situations that are impacted, whether directly or indirectly, I think not only does it allow for greater sense-making, but it also does actually spark greater curiosity and connections to everything else that we are as people and what we want to do. Then relevance becomes a non-issue. I know in the years that I taught high school, I had the opportunity to teach our second algebra course, our algebra two course, and then loop with those same students two years later when I taught them the AP calculus sequence. And it was amazing because the mindset was already there in the sense that we will connect what we do to what you will experience in your science class and in your English class and in your history and geography classes and in art and in architecture, because it is connected. So somewhere along the way, I think academics thought that by uber specializing, we're going to be able to get at strengths better. But I would maintain that the strength comes through the connections and the contexts. And I really appreciate that you've just said that the specializing can have a detrimental effect. And and it reminds me of this book, Range, that actually, Kyle, you led me on the path, uh, which is kind of about this idea between, it's not a math book, it's more of a general book, but it's about like how we tend to think that we should specialize. Like uh, if you wanted to create an athlete that's going to go to the Olympics, you need to specialize that athlete to only focus on swimming, you know, if they're going to go for swimming and that's it. And whereas the book makes a huge argument about generalists and opening your mind to so many different aspects of the world and different things that actually help you say become an Olympic athlete. It's a great book that kind of says that don't specialize, keep wider options, you know, become a studier of the world instead of just narrow down just because you think that you need to specialize. Right. And I think that's such a valid point. And I think both with the Range book and Malcolm Gladwell and some of the other work that he does, I think it's beautiful when you see things that might seem not related and then realize how closely aligned and just interconnected they are. And so I have these phenomenal conversations with my brothers, with my wife, with my father about how when we look at a beautiful building how much mathematics goes in it, but the people that were involved in constructing it, the considerations that they had to make culturally. So how can we separate the mathematics, the science, the geography, the history, the language? Why should we compartmentalize in such a way that dehumanizes? Because if you take that structure, it doesn't work necessarily in the same ways because it loses meaning 
because it can almost detach it from its community. And so maintaining that intentional connection with contexts and communities, I think, is at the heart of any learning experience, mathematics included. I couldn't agree more. I think I'm having my own little revelation here and I'm just thinking about our own journey. And when I go back to, you know, you'd mentioned earlier about how we're constantly growing. I like the analogy of the dimmer switch and how we're constantly trying to be better versions of ourselves, better teachers, better people. And now as you're talking about how important the context is, and early on we talked about how you've highlighted the importance of the access and equity piece, but also on the other side, and diversity, I should mention, but on the other side, the content knowledge as well, because when they are separate, it's very difficult. Like you look at it as two segmented, you look at it and you think you have to do one or the other instead of both together. And when I'm hearing you talk about the context and how important context is, I'm seeing that the journey John and I have been on, we've been on a similar journey, having worked together for quite some time now and trying to better our practice, better ourselves. And we focus so intentionally on context when we're creating math moment lessons and units. But now you've got me thinking on air here about how we can more intentionally pull in this community aspect, this what the community of learners that we're working to, like, how do we ensure and not connecting it from a, you know, this is what they like, but how it impacts their daily lives. And that's something that I think I'm going to be adding to my own annual learning plan this year is how can I make those contexts more intentional for the group of students that I work with? But then also, how do we help educators take our units that we share and offer them suggestions of how they might modify them to suit the students that they're working with in their context. And I'm just wondering, as I share that reflection out loud, does that give you any ideas or tips or suggestions? Or how do you go about this when you're planning a lesson? I'm really curious to see how you can keep that intentionality there at the forefront without feeling that sense of overwhelm. Hmm. That's a huge challenge, and I'm still learning in that way myself. I think one of the ways is that I really, really enjoy listening and learning from my students, including the privilege I have of learning from a lot of graduate students and PhD students and teachers that I have the opportunity to do professional development with, because our best ideas don't happen in a vacuum. Our students tell us what authentically works for them and what only may work in our minds. And so the goal isn't to design a task or to carry out a task that we love. If so, then, you know, more power to us. Stay at home and do that by ourselves. The goal is how would potentially through engagement with topics, through having specific learning goals in mind and then implementing tasks intentionally, how do we get closer to actually making a difference and coming an inch closer to wanting to have realizations or steps to move forward individually and then collectively. So one of the ways that I'm really proud of, again, comes through collaboration. And so my great friend, Sarah Bush, and then my PhD student, Siddhi Desai, and I, about three, four years, four years ago now, we started to think about the notion of gerrymandering and how much it affected so many of our communities. But in every way, there are so many mathematical concepts that lead into this, from areas to equivalence versus equal notions, to spatial reasoning, to ratios, to proportions, to the way that we draw and partition things. That almost cuts through the entire K-12 curriculum. How do we actually, when we want to engage students, had the opportunity to engage elementary students, middle school students, and high school students, and now college students, and then look at the different learning goals and how does understanding the mathematics that's appropriate for that level help us to understand that picture? So I try to do a lot of zooming in and zooming out intentionally 
where I want people to have a sense of the large picture. But then we also need to look at it from the zoomed in so that we understand not only the nuances, but how the pieces fit together. Two things I wanted to just to highlight that you said, uh, one thing I appreciated with you said that we're all kind of moving an inch. Like we're not going to just all of a sudden become these teachers that jump from one end of a spectrum to another. It's like we're slowly inch by inch changing along the way. And then that last one that you said is, you know, like the two different views of seeing kind of lessons and how to connect with your students. Cal, correct me if I'm wrong. I think it was Graham Fletcher we were talking with, and he was calling it like the six foot view versus the 60,000 foot view, giving like an image to think about those two ways to look at your lessons, look at your curriculum, look at your planning for those students. But I really appreciated the, the things that you've been saying here in this chat about making that context, like context is king. And that's the way we can not only engage our students, but also connect with them as human beings. And I'm wondering right now, during this conversation, if you could leave, you know, what would be this last big message that you could leave our listeners with before we wrap up here? I think one of the big messages would be to, again, intentionally look at sort of transdisciplinary connections that connect us all as human beings with our interests, to be able to take advantage of the beauties of people, cultures, innovations, and to recognize that there is inherently mathematical aspects that we should be exploring. But many of those mathematical notions have huge sociopolitical implications that come through our actions, but also our inactions in what we do and what we fail to do or what we choose not to do. And so I try to also make sure that I love working with images, and so I like to highlight how the power of, for instance, these wonderful centuries-old trees comes from the fact that their roots are connected. So the reason they can withstand all these storms and all these things that could happen is because of their connections. Some of those connections are seen, some of those corrections are not seen. As well as when you look at, again, connecting, say, math, science, architecture, art. I love pointillism paintings because you see aspects when you look very closely, but then when you step back, you sort of gain a whole other appreciation. And sometimes intentionally by the artist, you actually see multiple pictures within one. And our students need more experiences. And we need to make sure as teachers and teacher educators, we find ways for mathematics to continue to just spark this curiosity, to make sure that that sense-making is part of our daily lives, but so is connecting and feeling and not only empathizing, but almost activating what we can do for others beyond ourselves. No, oh, that's fantastic. It's a really important, and I love your analogy with the tree and the connections. And, you know, it speaks to us from the math perspective. And again, as John and I continue to try to find ways to connect our context to the context of our students, this has been a really helpful conversation, I know, for us and the Math Moment Maker community. So I'm wondering, before we say our goodbyes, Farshid, where might the Math Moment Maker community learn more about you and your work in math education? Well, so I'm pretty active on Twitter. So at Farshid Safi was not taken. And so that is me. So a lot of the things that I think about, but also I try to share and elevate the beautiful work that other people are doing in mathematics education and in ways that we support our students, our teachers, our schools, and our communities. So I would say Twitter to begin with, at Farshid Safi. If my professional obligations allow, I'm hoping to actually dedicate more to a uh, web page and like a blog series, but I promised myself to see a few things through by September, so I want to do those first. But I'm also very active in NCTM, in AMTE, or and I'm trying to learn more about TODOS so that I can do more. And so through those organizations, I make a point of not only being present to share, but also being present to learn. And so I would encourage people to check out some of those things. But at the same time, 
we talked about identity. One of the good things about having the name Farshid Safi is people can just Google it, right? <laughs> and so there aren't too many Farshid Safis that I know about. And so what I'm hoping people recognize is that we don't have to confine ourselves to these structures that somebody else decided upon. You can promote equitable teaching practices and really focus on content and connections. And I've tried to do that, and I'm committed to learning how to do that even better. We'll put all those links in the show notes and some of the resources that you've mentioned here. And, and I know that I've had lots of time here to reflect in this conversation. I know Kyle has as well, uh, as we often do with our guests. But uh, definitely want to thank you, uh, Farshid, for, for joining us here and helping our math moment makers in the community think about the ways that they can uh, impact the community and their students. Thank you very much. I really enjoy talking to you, and I look forward to learning more in the near future. Awesome. Thank you, Farshid. We'll talk to you soon. Math Moment Makers, we can't thank Farshid enough for spending time with us to share his ideas and insights with you, the Math Moment Maker community, and with John and I, because as you know, we learn a ton by participating in these conversations. Yes, absolutely. Before we go, we definitely want to remind you of the upcoming 2020 Make Math Moments Virtual Summit, which is coming up on Saturday, November 7th and Sunday, November 8th. And now you can get registered. Head over there right now. Right. This is one of our favorite times of year, as we mentioned at the beginning of the episode, and we get the honor of bringing some amazing math minds from the math education space straight to you. And not just like you, like people here in Ontario, where John and I are from, or in Canada, where we're from, or in North America, but actually around the globe. We've got people registered from Australia, New Zealand, India, all over the globe. We are so excited because we get to do it all for free. Yes, and if you want some amazing math professional learning from the comfort of your home and couch, we encourage you to pause the episode right now and head to makemathmoments.com forward slash summit to register for the 2020 Make Math Moments Virtual Summit. Yes, our second annual free online math professional development summit is for you because you are likely either a kindergarten through grade 12 mm. math educators. So there's something for everyone. The dates again are Saturday, November 7th and Sunday, November 8th. And again, a reminder, Farshid, from this episode is one of our over 30 speakers. Yeah. One of the best parts this year is that we have a number of live sessions over Zoom as some other sessions are pre-recorded for you to enjoy at your convenience over the weekend and up to a week afterwards on the replays. How exciting this year. We're going to be sharing a session by Christina Lincoln Moore, who's discussing mathematics and mindfulness. And we've got Chris Lesniak, a recent guest on this podcast. He's going to be sharing a session on debate in math class. Register now for this year's summit at makemathmoments.com forward slash summit. If you're listening to this episode after this year's summit, the replays will be up until November 13th, and then they're going to be in the academy for members to gobble up at will. Hop on over to makemathmoments.com forward slash summit to catch those replays or to find out how you can get into the academy to watch them at will. Show notes and links to resources from this episode can be found at makemathmoments.com forward slash episode 99. Again, that's makemathmoments.com forward slash episode 99. Awesome stuff. And remember, those transcripts are available on our show notes pages. So go grab them. Well, Math Moment Makers, until next time, I'm Kyle Pierce. And I'm John Orr. High fives for us. And a big high five for you. <laughs>